My name is Stephen Hans. I'm a specialist solution architect with Amazon Web Services, AWS. Presenting with me today is uh, Itai Mowers. He's the general manager of in-memory database services, AWS. Also presenting with me is Lila Gunod Bandla. He's a principal software engineer with uh, Warner Brothers, HBO. Also is Shabir Yusuf. He's a senior manager, data engineering, Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, I don't think that it needs too much introduction what uh, HBO Max does, but actually here's a little taser for you so you can see it. Our worth is not given. It must be made. You have no idea what loss is. <clears throat> it's very intoxicating to bend the rules. Color outside the lines. Would you be interested in having an affair? Oh, wow! Surprise! <laughs> this is going to be one of the best nights of my life! <laughs> what are we doing? Changing, Changing the, the world. world. That's right. We're pushing forward! <laughs> I'm always chasing the music. I have the drive. I have the passion. Wow, wasn't that amazing, huh? Wasn't that interesting? All those titles, all those shows, season after season. But uh, what's uh, probably even more amazing to us in the technology field is to have the capability to deliver all those shows on time to millions of customers, millions of subscribers around the world. Which actually brings us to our first item of our agenda, is that the customers expect speed and performance. Uh, after that, my colleagues from HBO are going to take the stage and going to talk about how they use uh, Amazon Elastic Cache to achieve scale and performance and achieve significant cost savings. After that, we'll have a bit of a more overview of Amazon Elastic Cache. Then we'll see of some of the new features that were introduced this year, and then finish up the session with questions and answers. So we talked about the scale and performance that's needed as comes with the video streaming industry. In fact, one of the industries that benefited the most of the COVID-19 the pandemic was the video streaming industry. A lot of people were at home. They had no options for entertainment. They turned on their TVs. There's great content. There's great providers. What was happening, basically, a lot of people subscribed to more and more services. In fact, over 50% of the people surveyed are streaming more now post-COVID than before COVID. And the revenue numbers show that in the past and is projected for the future as well. In fact, about 21% of the surveyed adults subscribe to an additional streaming service now, post-COVID than before that. So obviously there is demand for that. The customers like it, going forward want that, but this comes with some requirements. Customers are pretty much accustomed to performance. Uh, they are aware that all of these businesses operate online in a mobile space. They are aware that of cloud computing and 5G networks, so they expect performance. Basically, what it is, they expect real-time performance for all of their applications. You could almost say that, that latency is not an option anymore. In fact, the less interactive an application becomes, the more likely that they're going to turn to one of their competitors. So performance matters. Why does performance matter? Well, because the slower a website is to load, the more the chances are that your clients are going to turn away and probably use one of their customers' competitors. In fact, it's clearly measurable that about 90% of your customers will turn away if your website is slow to load. So what are they going to do? They're going to go to one of your competitors. Close to 50% are going to go to your competitors. And if their website is faster, about 24% of them may not even return. So we talk about what speed is that measurable. Yes, actually it is measurable. A uh, 100 uh, millisecond in delay of loading your website affects your conversion rate by about 7%. Uh, just clicker, come on. Is, is a, a speed the only, only necessary measuring stick that you can do? I mean, obviously you could throw resources behind your application and just make it run fast, but speed alone probably is not gonna solve all of your problems. You have to be able to manage all those sessions. These customers have multiple devices. They might start watching the show, maybe in their cars, with there's new cars, or on their phone or mobile, go home watching on their set-top box or whatever they have to. So you have to be able to manage all those sessions. 
In addition to that, you have to be able to have relevant content recommendations in real time. You want to be able to scroll those screens and have to have the proper content there and to have to scale. When the new release, the new title is released, everybody wants to see it at the same time. You have to be able to scale to meet that demand on the spot and not just locally, globally. So when you face these kind of requirements, a customer base that, that knows that there is capacity there anymore, they know that there's cloud computing, so capacity should not be an issue anymore. You design applications that are basically cloud aware and internet scale applications. And these are not your traditional applications anymore. As a result, they don't use your traditional databases anymore. So when it comes to that, AWS provides the broadest portfolio of specialized database services to meet those demands for applications. So on the left-hand side, you see that we still have, obviously, it's not gonna go away anytime soon, the traditional relational databases that are still there to work, that we provide, but we have newer modern databases as well. We have key value stores, or document databases, or even column oriented databases. But when it comes to speed, the fastest way to get your data is to have your data in memory. And in order to manage all that data in memory, you need a caching service, a scalable, affordable caching service. And for that, AWS provides Amazon Elastic Cache, an ultra-fast, scalable, managed caching service for your applications. With that, I'm going to introduce my colleagues from HBO Max, who are going to talk about how they achieve scale and performance with Elastic Cache. Shabir? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry. What an assorted array of chocolates to choose from. I mean, I beg your pardon. Assorted array of database services, managed database services in the cloud to choose from, <coughs> from AWS. So a bit about HBO Max. HBO Max, as we just saw, is a streaming video platform where you can watch the movies you love, the, uh, all of HBO TV and uh, drama series. You got all of those uh, streaming on one, on, on one platform. Now, um, so what's the, what's the purpose of all of that is watch your shows um, and films that you've come to love. Launched in the US in uh, 2020, uh, today HBO Max runs in about 61 countries in the, in the world and has apparently 94.9 million subscribers here at Warner Brothers Discovery, and that's in just under two years. A uh, little bit about what it is that my team uh, does here at Warner Brothers Discovery. We are database reliability engineering and operations, and a few of the things we do uh, include uh, basically working with the service engineering team to choose among all of those options that, that we just saw, which would be a right fit. What is the most purpose-built data store that you should be choosing for that microservice? Um, the principles we follow there, uh, or the key questions that we ask for making those choices, include what's the nature of your data? What is your access patterns? And what are your growth projections over time? Then, um, and actually, before making those choices available, we actually develop infrastructure as code, uh, modules ready to go, uh, deploy stuff in the cloud for you when, when the choice has been made. Um, so we develop that in-house. We collaborate with the service engineering teams, making the choices for what would be an appropriate data model, what would be a good startup configuration, how you're gonna productionize it when the time comes. And then um, you actually made your choices, you've understood what your configuration should be, now it's time to provision that in the cloud. So we do that in, in using those infrastructure as code modules you just talked about, and we provision those in, in, in the cloud. Um, but more importantly, through the life cycle of those data stores that the microservices are gonna use them, we take care of sizing them appropriately, we scale them, we deploy them, and then we tune them as is necessary. The objective during all of that is just one. What is that? That is the latency problem that Stephen was talking about. You don't want users to be put off by a millisecond of delay when they wanna watch that favorite show. So as part of today's agenda, we will be talking about what at HBO Max, we have, uh, which problem we have solved by using AWS Global Elastic Cache Redis, and uh, in the last two years, what have we come to learn and change HBO Max with it. So let me lay out the problem for you before we do that. Um, we had this spiky patterns of traffic of users that want to watch the platform. You know, as soon as the, the asset's available, they want to come watch the House of the Dragon, the Euphoria. 
And there's one thing common about all of these assets on our platform. When you know, a Matrix is launched or, or you have uh, Westworld or, or the Wonder Woman 84 movie is premiered during the pandemic, you want to make sure that the users are getting that same experience that they got in, in, in the theaters. Um, there is the idea of a primetime release. What the primetime release means to us on the scaling side and the operations is a nightmare. What is that? Is, is that there's a burst of traffic, a whole bunch of people are gonna show up all at once, and within a seconds to a single digit minute at most, you're gonna have millions of users who were not there in that previous minute watching the show or wanting to watch the show as soon as it's available. That leads to bursts of traffic uh, and a possible retry storm if, if you're not ready for it. And at the top of the hour, you have those requests. Everybody wants to log into the, to the app and have that, you know, wh whichever device that they're using, have, th have the asset available and ready to play. For um, microservices in EKS or however we, we deploy them, they're able to scale. You have auto scalers set up. You, you can have you know, Kubernetes or uh, the, the services are set up for HPA. They, they just scale up. But what about the data layer? Again, we, we look at that, that traffic pattern I was talking about. Um, this basically simulates a hockey stick here as, as you look at. So at the top of the hour, a you know, couple of seconds or more, you just have a whole bunch of users starting to request, I need the page. Uh, to onboard all of those users, uh, that means you have to now give them a landing page. That means think about the pages, the menus, the queries, all of that that makes for one unique user experience on one device for someone sitting in either Philadelphia or here in Nevada, home state of New Jersey, wherever, wherever they come from. Now, Multiply that with a few million and that you have to serve them in the same second. And I don't even have to say this. The, the idea of a cache is pretty much clear at this point, isn't it? Before we dive into the, how we have solved the problem, how it looks today in the architecture a little bit, this is how it used to look like in the prequel world, if you will. You have a service that's using MongoDB, someone's using a DynamoDB, another one using an RDS, some can scale auto automatically like DynamoDB, but RDS only so much. MongoDB, you're running on a hosted EC2. There's a whole bit of, bunch of operations you need to do to scale that, in, and def definitely not happening in a minute. So every user request is basically is to be served by penetrating into multiple levels of your microservices. Each of those have to scale and appropriately respond and your availability is now dependent on all of those services being available, you will have a tremendous increase in unpredictable response times if one of those components were to fail. And therefore, you are left with multiple possible points of failure. This kind of architecture basically means that you could uh, be left with a lot of ways you can go wrong with this on a, on a, on a big day. And therefore, is a financially very costly option to operate. Now, with that, may I hand over to my colleague and friend, Vinod, to talk about how the world looks today. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Shabir. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lila Vinod Banla. I'm principal SE at uh, Warner Bros. Discovery. And as Shabir shared the stage um, the, with the prequel problem, now let's see in the new world how this has been addressed. As you see in the, in the image, um, the primary region where the content services are separated from the user journey. When a user request comes, it doesn't go through all the content service to form or stitch the response to respond to the user. However, it's been a separate service where um, the content data will be pre-generated for the future timelines. <laughs> Let's go through them with the advantages in this model and uh, we can explain those things. And highly av high availability. So when the requests are coming here, uh, there is a least amount of work has to be done for the uh, service to respond. And in the user journey, there is it's no need to penetrate with the multiple service in order to respond. And it's highly available. And one layer serves multiple user requests. In the past, every request has to penetrate. And now, in the new future, uh, only one service that is responsible to serve all the user traffic. Of course, that service is scaled to thousands of parts. And, but there is no other dependency apart from that service directly reading from the uh, Redis replicas. 
and pre-generate timelines. Let me explain what about the timeline. So each timeline is nothing but uh, generating the timeline points or HM sets per country, device language specific. So if you have X number of device supported in that country and whatever the language is, uh, there will be a record present with the HM set which will have the entire landing page, series data, everything being read from that HM set. So those timelines will be generated periodically in a finite amount of time by the content services. And write in primary region, so it's write in one region and read in respective local region, so that in that way the users no need to traverse uh, to the cross regions to read the uh, data from the cluster. And increase performance as you compare the old model and the previous model, um, the current and previous model, the latency response is tremendously improved uh, with, the, with the new models. And financial saving, so the, here is the multiple financial savings we had it, like we don't need to scale the X number of uh, content services uh, for the prime time, but just the one single services to accommodate the user bus traffic. And before going to the next slide, here I would like to go explain one of the story what happened here. Before AWS Elastic Global Store uh, release, uh, we were managing, the, uh, the engineering team was managing the Redis clusters on EC2s where it's a very tedious job for the uh, engineering team to manage the clusters for high availability and take care of the replication uh, for multiple regions. Uh, so thanks to AWS who listens to their customers and give us the Elastic Cache global data stores, which we were seamlessly able to onboard because all of our timelines are future timelines. When the graph timelines are generated for the future timelines in the new cluster, the application is simply point to the new cluster so that it starts consuming the data. So with this model where we see like the data gets replicated uh, in the same region and to the cross region and multi-region is on the hood, we will get it from the purpose-built database with uh, multi-AZ features. And for our scenario, we have chosen the cluster mode off where the data is not shareable for our use case and which works successfully and able to do many prime shows. Uh, periodic writes for the future timelines. So the timelines are always for the future timeline. It's immutable data so that the prime time assets or prime time series are pre-generated and available readily for consumption. And read current active timelines by the users. The user always reads only the active timelines, not the uh, inactive or uh, the future timelines. The writes, right, the one which we have written for the future timeline, sometimes those things will be validated by our QA team or privileged customers who can do the time travel to verify the assets or are, are popular events are available at the future timelines. And we use a Graviton 2 instances and we upgraded our cluster clusters from five to six and that provide us the necessary performance and as well as the cost saving. And highly performant in this sense, like um, the request whichever is coming, they don't need to uh, uh, penetrate with multiple services, but do, uh, do just a negligible to least amount of effort, computational effort to read the records from the uh, Redis cluster. And yes, AWS provided us the uh, global data store. Has this been enough, sufficient enough for us to uh, achieve the necessary scale and bust? Let's see what are all the other parameters we have tuned and uh, taken care to get that much of scalability. So parameter groups, two parameters mainly we have tuned. One is the replication backlog size. As we have moved the content services to pre-generate the timelines, the content services are taking longer time, more than an hour to generate the graph time. And this has especially become a bottleneck when we started onboarding uh, LATAM and EU countries. More countries are coming into this model and we, had, um, we have to complete the timelines within the hour. So increasing the replication backlog, we have set it to one GB, but typically we see like 200 to 300 MB is our ingestion rate when the TAF lines are being generating. So that parameter helped us to uh, generate the future timelines within a finite amount of time. And max memory policy, uh, this is one thing we have um, had an issue and choose like uh, no eviction as our uh, strategy. I'll explain this more in detail at the end of this slide. Um, and we did vertical scale a couple of times uh, to get the necessary scale throughput uh, where we have observed like uh, uh, network bandwidth allow out allowance exceeded a couple of times when we have a major releases are happening and that triggered uh, the need for the vertical scale for higher throughput. And 
the memory parameter, even to achieve more memory, uh, we had to vertical scale the cluster. When we try to onboard more and more countries into our platform, uh, we need a higher memory to accommodate more languages and more country uh, specific devices in that uh, into the memory. So in those two cases, we had went for the vertical scaling for our clusters. And uh, when we haven't seen these kind of issues, like still we want more throughput from that uh, replicas. Replicas engine CPU is getting hot, and uh, is the vertical scaling is the only option? Let's see. Uh, we went with our model of let's say, uh, why can't we do the horizontal scaling to save cost? And given our use case scenario, the writes are not like continuously happening, but at a predefined interval and definite amount of time, we were able to get um, 15 replicas in each region. Uh, so that we can handle our traffic within a, uh, during the bus period. And one more parameter which is very interesting is, initially we don't have the Lua scripts, uh, any limit has been set. So uh, thanks to AWS who uh, provided the CloudWatch logs, um, so with which we were able to consume them and uh, see that the Lua scripts are started appearing in our CloudWatch log metrics. Uh, and with the AWS recommendation, we have said that iteration uh, 200 uh, keys per iteration. That's, uh, this parameter has been significantly improved the performance, and we started disappearing. Uh, the slow logs are disappeared from the uh, CloudWatch logs. Oops, sorry. And the no eviction policy, like there are a couple of reasons why we have chosen the no eviction policy. Since we have chosen no eviction policy, somebody has to evict, right? So the uh, custom scripts has been written to see like uh, periodically run in the uh, connect to the Redis cluster primary to see like whether there are any inactive graph, uh, graph timelines so that it can delete and reclaim the space. And at the same time, I want to give like why we haven't chosen the TTL, uh, volatile TTL or all key seller, which are all the most popular max memory policies. So volatile uh, TTL, if we keep it, and sometimes we may have ingestion issues and we, want, we cannot ingest the new timelines in the uh, given timeline period. And at the same time, we don't want our current timelines to be disappeared from the memory, causing an outage. So we throw out that model. And then all key seller you, um, especially we haven't chosen this model, the reason being uh, whenever there are the House of the Dragon or Game of Thrones or any uh, high uh, spiky traffic events, we want the timelines to be generated well in advance and during the uh, prime time, we don't want to do any more new timelines writing from the system. So that whole computation effort is just given to the replicas to serve the traffic rather than for the uh, replicating the data. And we see like uh, how we have saved the cost by consuming the global data stores or even the single region uh, Redis cluster. Uh, as we seen in the initial diagram, the content services are generating the graph bill. As I mentioned, like when the more countries are onboarded, the video metadata service and catalog services, these are global service and um, the records would be globally consumed irrespective of whether it's North America or South America or Europe, that's a single database. And we see that these databases are um, going very high CPU and memory consumption and network throughput, and we did a couple of times vertical scaling. And then when more countries are added, so we thought, okay, this, something is wrong in this approach. Let's see whether we can add a elastic cache to save more cost. And adding a, opting for a single region cluster mode enabled clusters uh, provided us the necessary saving and in thousands of dollars cost saving. And have said this problem, like we have the uh, service penetrating to the multiple uh, uh, services and the scaling issue, cost issue. Let's see what are all the takeaways that we have with this uh, approach that HBO Max is following it up. So configure cluster for high availability. Whenever you are deploying a cluster, don't disable or turn off the multi-AZ or failover capability, which comes by default turned on. Enable cluster mode for flexible and high scalability for your high rights or high reads. And use Graviton instances uh, for best price performance. And pair your databases wherever is applicable with Elastic Cache to reduce the cost and achieve the scaling at same time. And monitor for slow logs and engine logs for any kind of anomalies. And especially when you have a bust uh, volume of request coming uh, for any kind of reason. Um, see that even though you pre-scale the cluster, do a load test to, uh, to catch any 
uh, latencies or anything anomalies that is showing up in this low loss. Thank you very much. Oh, to Stephen. Thank you, Vinod. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, obviously, scaling to 15 read replicas, maybe not be for everybody, but uh, obviously, if you need that, we, we can do that. We could deliver it locally and globally. With that, let's have a little bit more uh, technical overview of our Amazon Elastic Cache. Now, you might have heard about Amazon Elastic Cache. That's the name of the service. However, the service itself supports two different compute engines. It supports the memcache compute engine, which is a fully managed caching service for you, scalable. And it also supports the Redis-based compute engine, which some people call it an in-memory data store, also a key value man managed uh, service. Uh, today, we're going to dive in a bit more, more detail into the Redis engine, what it does, how it works, how you could take advantage of it. So here's a little bit of a roadmap of the six bullet points that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the, the compatibility with Redis, how it's fully managed, what it means, how you can take advantage of all those services, high availability, both locally and globally, performance, what we mean about extreme performance, security, and finally, the scalability. Thank you. <laughs> so Elastic Cache, the memcached is a key value bear store, but so is the Redis based. The Redis one is 100% compatible with open source Redis. It supports all the data types, and this can be a great advantage for your application. For example, it supports uh, hashes, strings, sorted sets, or geospatials as well. Here's kind of like an example why you might use it for in which uh, implementation and an example for those. We will see a little bit more of this later on. Next, let's compare it to uh, maybe a self-managed one. Because it's compatible with open source Redis, some of you might run it on your premises or maybe have a self-managed one on an EC2, which, which you can do. However, you don't take advantage of all the capability that we can do to the managed service. One of them is, for example, you don't have to bother with uh, acquisition. We provide the service for you. The services are provided for you, including the hardware, the software, and not just the operating system, the engine software as well, and the patching for them as well. So if a minor patch is released for Elastic Cache uh, Memcached or Elastic Cache for Redis, it's going to be patched for you. In addition to that, we did all the setup and the configuration management and the backup as well. So obviously, this is going to simplify your operations significantly. It has high availability capability. We're going to have a little bit more on that. It supports local multi-AZ with automatic failover and global as well with global data store. It has scalability. So with scalability, obviously, you never want to under-provision and affect your workloads or over-provision and basically spend your money and uh, get services for that. When it comes to that, actually, it's quite cost-effective because you only pay for per instance. There's no additional network or I.O. charges for that. In addition to that, we support reserved instances for extra cost savings and data tiering instances as well. Uh, we talked about high availability. So if you run it in something called cluster mode enabled, which supports sharding, sharding is when you have basically shared nothing. You have multiple primary nodes and you have multiple read replicas. So in this case, we represent a, a sort of a virtual cluster, a simplified version of it that has only three shards represented by three different colors. We have the white, the blue, and the green. Each one of them has a, a primary node and two read replicas. So what do we mean about high availability? Let's say maybe some maintenance is going on. Uh, or maybe some unexpected uh, service interruption were to happen, the node that is affected is automatically taken out of the cluster, and the nearest read replica is promoted to be the next primary, and you basically are not going to experience a service outage. However, we do more than that, not just automatic failover. The affected node is actually taken out of the cluster. Behind the scenes, a new one is added, it's provisioned, and the data, a snapshot is taken from the original, and it's replicated to it and brought back into the service. So basically, your original configuration was to have one primary with two read replicas. And if you have a, some sort of an event that causes uh, to interrupt that, you will be back to the same configuration. So your throughput is not going to be affected. Which talks about performance. What do we mean about extreme performance? When it comes to uh, Elastic Cache, the response time is measured in milliseconds. Not microseconds, milliseconds. We talked about it that 100 milliseconds will affect your conversion rate. Well, that's at the, at the end, what the customer experiences. Obviously, every millisecond counts starting from the database, the database access layer. So at this layer, we measure it in microseconds. 
and we can scale. We could scale up to millions of transactions per second, especially when we are in cluster mode, in sharded mode configuration. In addition to that, we support large sizes of cache. We, as you can see, it, we could grow up to 340 terabytes of all in-memory cache. This obviously with multiple nodes. And in addition to that, if you go for uh, the data tiering instances, we support up to one petabyte. A data tiering instance is one that actually has a local NVMe attached drive, and if the local memory is filled in, it's gonna overspill to the local disk, automatically managed for you. If you wanna learn more about that, how that works, there's a presentation tomorrow, that 321, that is going to go into more details how exactly data tiering works and the cost savings that you could realize from there. We have enhanced the I.O. This is not the basic uh, open source Redis I.O. We increased basically the network throughput by 80% and reduced latency by about 40%. Obviously, this on multiple cores that we could take advantage of, multiple CPU cores. And finally, it runs on our proprietary Graviton 2 instance, or actually even the earlier Graviton ones, which kind of gives you the best performance for your money, the best value for your money. So we've seen it that it is scalable, it's compliant. How about security? Yes, it is secure. We do support encryption in transit, so while your data travels to the electric cache, or even between the nodes, it's fully encrypted. So data encryption in flight is supported, and we also support encryption at rest. So you might be asking, okay, the data is in memory, why would I need encryption at rest? So for example, when you take a backup, that backup is going to be encrypted for you automatically. If you need to take a snapshot to rebuild a node, that's done through a, through a snapshot procedure in the back end, and that's gonna be encrypted, so your data is protected even at that time. In addition to that, if you run it on a Graviton 2 type of instance, even the memory is encrypted itself. So if you work in some sort of a highly regulated industry or some government agency that requires that, we support that as well. Uh, authentication and authorization. We do support integration with the IAM, so you could set up IAM uh, access to it. You don't have to use the native uh, authentication protocol that comes with Redis that used to be in the past. With version 7 now we support integration with IAM. And with version 6 onwards, we support Robix as access control. So what does that mean? Just, just take a second there. You could actually limit the keys or the data a user or a group access has to. So you could limit that way. And you could limit the command. So you could actually box in a user or a set of users to a specific key or a specific commands. Gives you a lot of control who has access to what. So when you put all this in perspective, obviously we meet a number of compliance and regulatory requirements. We are HIPAA eligible, PCI compliant, and FedRAMP authorized. So let's just look on for some scalability. We did see that uh, HBO Max did need some scaling. We support actually two different scaling models. We support the vertical scaling, which is in cluster mode disabled, where you can just scale, put in a bigger instance and bigger instance. However, however as you can see, there's going to be a limit. What's the biggest instance that you can acquire or makes financial sense to you? Another way to do it is actually going to a cluster mode, which is a sharded mode. This is a shared nothing, where in the event that you need to scale, you just keep adding more shards. And you could add actually hundreds of shards. Uh, actually, if you don't support, you don't want to support uh, read replicas, everything is going to be just a primary shard, which we don't recommend. You could have up to 500 shards. One of the advantages of running it in a sharded mode is auto scaling. We support auto scaling. Again, if you have a variable workload, you don't want to waste resources or you don't want to affect your workload either. So in that case, you could turn on auto scaling and we actually we can track two different metrics. You could uh, track the CPU metrics or you could track the memory utilization. If you're about to run out of memory, if you're all in memory alone, then you can just add another shard, grow your cluster horizontally. Or if the CPU is starting to be hit, the CPU limit, then again, you can just automatically add another shard. Another way we support, if you have a more predictable workload, is a scheduled basic uh, short, uh, scaling, where you have a predictable workload that at given time or of the day or a future, you could scale up. And if you notice the arrows point in both, both directions, you could scale up and scale down depending on, on what your workload is. So you never waste resources and you're never going to impact your workloads just because maybe you have a variable workload or you have a big sales event. Like we, I don't know, I think it was something called Black Friday recently. So you want to meet that requirement at any time. When it comes to global reach, we can do that as well. Uh, 
I'm sure many of you in the past, what they have done is you implemented database replicas just to bring the data close to your clients. When you have a global customer, you want to bring the data close to your clients, and one way to do that is to replicate your database. However, you probably found it out that in many cases that it's slow or possibly expensive to replicate your whole database, a disk-based replication. So in that case, what you could do, use Elastic Cache and just replicate the data, the so-called hot data that is needed. So with Elastic Cache, a global data store, you could set up a primary cluster in one region, in this case it's on the West Coast, and set up two additional clusters in two additional regions where you replicate the data to it. Now, this is a one-way replication. You have the primary that's open in read-write mode, and the additional clusters are in read-only mode that brings the data close to your client. One advantage of doing this is that actually these three clusters don't necessarily have to be configured for exact same capacity. So maybe you have a kind of a business that follows the sun kind of operations that early in the day, you need more read capacity in the Asia pack region. You can have more read replicas there. So in that case, you know, save money. Why have uh, read replicas and read capacity in a region or global region where there's no requirements for it? So early in the day, you could scale up in Asia pack and as you can do like a follow the sun model as later in the day, maybe scale up in Europe and scale back in Asia. You can do that. And again, you just do it with your hot data. Uh, here are some of the uh, customers that we have and how they use Elastic Cache, what they use it for. It's used quite a lot in uh, web and mobile applications. Again, those, those data types that you saw earlier come very handy, especially if you use them not just a simple caching. If you use those built-in data types, can really help your application tremendously because what you do, you move all that computation that you would do on your application side, you move it to the cache and it's done in memory in real time, all of it. Because that's, that's, that's the nature of Redis, that's what you get the advantage of all those data types. So one of them is for session management. Web services use that a lot for session management. Geospatial, if your application is related, any kind of like food delivery, even a dating app, anything that has to do with geo coordinates, you don't have to calculate those anymore on your application sites. You could do it in real time in your cache side. Next one is retail. Retail applications take great advantage of caching service. One of them, they reduce the pressure from their backend databases. So you can cache your results, put them in the cache, and scale down maybe your databases. You don't have to spend that much on your database services. And of course, inventory tracking, anything like that needs real-time updates. The data types are in there that could help you with that. Gaming, the gaming industry is one of our biggest customers. They use that a lot. In this case, they use it a lot in um, leaderboards, real-time leaderboards. You have millions of users, your favorite gaming application, whatever you have to, everybody wants to know where he's ranked. In the past, you would probably have to bring all that data in from your database, all that data in from your users, and sort it on your application side. You don't have to do that. You could do it in real time in your cache with the sorted set. That does it for you really fast in memory, so you just pull it out of there. You don't have to bring more data to your application, have extra data going through your network. You could save on that as well. Next is in banking and finance. Again, the banking and the finance industry is a highly regulated industry. They want to make sure that they don't have transactions go through that are not approved. For example, in anti-money laundering, AML. In that case, you want to be able to filter transactions in real time, all of them. So they use Elastic Cash for that to have access to your data or just high-speed trading. Very important. Machine learning. The more data you have access to, the faster you could build your models, train them, and deploy them. One way to have fast access to your data is to have them in a cache. Of course, you could do it for automatic decision making. And finally, IoT devices. IoT devices generate a lot of data that comes in very fast. You need to be able to, able to ingest that data fast, and Elastic Cache can do that. It ingests data very fast, and it has built-in data types, such as streams, that integrates very well with Apache and, uh, and Kafka, or, or Amazon Kinesis, so it integrates with that, getting the data, do real-time analysis. With that, I'm going to turn it over with, to my colleague, Itai, who's going to talk about the new features that were added in 2022. All right. Uh, thanks, Steven, Shabir, and Vinod. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm always excited to see our customers share their success stories. It's really cool to see how we helped HBO Max achieve such a massive scale with such great performance. 
My name is Itai, and I'm the general manager of in-memory databases at AWS. I will briefly talk about the new features that we released this year. I'll start off by saying that all of these features are available to you at no additional cost. Starting with the new and improved management console available to you at the AWS console, it simplifies the user experience when creating and managing Elastic Cache clusters. With the engines, I'll start with Memcached. We support Memcached 1.6.12, which has performance improvements, operational improvements, and better thread management, across, among other things. We launched support for encryption in transit for Memcached using TLS 1.2. Similar to our Redis offering that has all of the security features that Steven just talked about, our customers, our Memcached customers, also wanted this additional security layer. So we built this layer with Memcached both on the service side and also on the client side. We vend both uh, Java and PHP clients, and you can have those client libraries available on our website, on the AWS uh, management console, and on GitHub. Encryption in transit paved the way to get Memcached certified with FedRAMP and HIPAA eligible and we're working to get it to the same compliance that we have with Redis, including PCI DSS and SOC. We, support launch, we launched support for IPv6. Some of our largest customers achieved such a massive scale that they really needed support for IPv6. We supported for both in two modes. One, which is uh, uh, only IPv6, so the cluster, will accept only IPv6 connections. And the other one is a dual mode, where the cluster will accept both IPv6 and IPv4 connections. We have this functionality available for both Redis and Memcached. In the beginning of the year, we launched the Redis log delivery feature through Kinesis Data Firehose and CloudWatch Logs. For those of you who are more power users and would like to have this additional transparency and visibility into what's happening in the engine, what's happening in the Redis engine, you can use this feature. An example of that, uh, which we not talked about earlier, is if you want to analyze a slow command, what is a slow command with Redis? I mean, it's fast, it's in memory. Well, a slow command, uh, Redis also has a lot of functionality, so you can do expensive command, for example, fetching all of the keys in the database. If you have millions of keys, that could be pretty expensive. You can think about other examples of fetching all of the data in a hash set or in other collections. So you have this kind of functionality using the slow logs and also with the engine logs through this feature. Um, I would like to highlight that this is an operational insights feature. We, by design, omit all of the customer data from these logs for your protection. We launched support for native JSON for our Redis offering. You can fetch, store, and update JSON objects on your Elastic Cache for Redis clusters uh, without the needing to write any code for serialization and deserialization. You can fetch and update a portion of the JSON object with Elastic Cache for Redis, and also you can use the JSON path in order to search for data within your JSON object. This gives you a very powerful solution because you get the Redis uh, and Elastic Cache Redis uh, microsecond read and microsecond re write latencies with the very popular and common JSON format. We support private link. Private link is a private connectivity between AWS services and the VP and the uh, and the uh, VPCs. All the traffic does not go through the public internet. When you set up a VPC interface endpoint, you will be able to connect to Elastic Cache APIs from, from applications within the, your VPCs and also from other VPCs using VPC peering and from on-premises using AWS VPN and AWS Direct Connect. We launched support for Redis 7. Redis 7 is the latest and greatest version that Redis has. It has key innovations like access control list v2, 
Redis function, and sharded PubSub that scales very well with the cluster mode enabled configuration. Elastic case supports up to 500 nodes in a single cluster. And having PubSub a very popular feature that our customers use, we really needed a solution that scales. So give it a try. It's, really, it's a really good, cool feature that we have with Redis 7. I'm also proud to say that my team worked together with the open source community to contribute the ACLv2 and the sharded PubSub to open source Redis 7. So those features are available there as well. The last feature that we released this year is the IAM authentication for Redis. It is uh, IAM is identity and access management. Up until we launched this feature, you were able to use the native Redis authentication system in order to do authentication. Now you can associate IAM users and roles with Elastic Cache for Redis users and then use the IAM for authentication. Together with the role-based access control that we have, you have a very powerful tool, RBAC, role-based access control for authorization, and IAM for authentication. And then this can work really well with the rest of your application in the AWS ecosystem using IAM for identity management and authentication. So these are the new features that we launched this year. There are uh, several more coming up in the next few months and uh, a lot more in the coming years, so stay tuned. Uh, a quick word I have about uh, general uh, global availability. As some of you may know, AWS is, av is available in 30 regions across the globe and 96 availability zones. Just this year, we launched new regions in Hyderabad, in Spain, in Switzerland, and in Dubai. Elastic Cache is a foundational service. It exists in all of the 30 regions that AWS has today, and it, will and it will be part of every region launch that we will continue to do in the future. So you can take this kind of dependency on Elastic Cache when you plan for your global scale. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you can scan this barcode here to get access for webinars and videos and blogs and, other, and presentations and other material that will help you get started with Amazon Elastic Cache. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your kind words when you fill the survey.